and it turned out that God used that or something they said or then you can speak into their lives and you can believe things. Dear Lord, Heavenly Father, thank you, Father, for the opportunity that you give us, oh Lord God, to give back a small portion, Lord God, of what you yourself bless us with, Father. We ask that you bless this offering, oh God, and multiply it for the furtherance of your kingdom. Lord, we ask this in Jesus' name, amen. Ushers, you may come and collect our tithes and offerings. I wanted to address something that's in the Word of God that we say a lot. I've said it myself, um, but I wanted to re-examine it a bit because if we get the wrong misunderstanding, um, it can cause some problems. As human beings, we we have a big uh, problem wrapping our brain around the fact or our minds around the fact about receiving a gift uh, or anything else from someone only to have it taken away. There, there is something that we have a, a problem with if someone gives us something and then they want it back or they take it back from us. We have terms uh, uh, for people like that and uh, uh, we, we, we struggle with that. Our sense of uh, right and wrong comes into play. And there's a, a scripture that uh, is quoted a lot, and, and rightly so. It's a, 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 from the book of Job uh, that we say a lot, and I have even uh, prayed that prayer at times when things have gotten really rough. And it's Job 121. Uh, the scripture says this, Naked I came from my mother's womb, and naked I will depart. The Lord gave, and the Lord has taken away May the name of the Lord be praised. Has anyone here ever prayed that in a time of deep trouble or despair? I'm the only one who's prayed that. Oh, no. <laughs> Amen. Um, I believe that uh, Job 121 is, has been greatly misunderstood. Some, sometimes people take it to mean that God randomly takes things away from us that he's given us. And that thought... I think, grossly mischaracterizes our benevolent God. Because God is famous for giving, not for taking. John 3.16, for God so loved the world that he gave. And of course, the most precious thing, his only son, that whosoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. And Romans 8.32, he who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all. How will he not also, along with him, graciously do what? Give us all things. Yeah. See, that, uh, that assessment that the Lord gives and the Lord takes away, it, it, it's really speaking of God's sovereignty, and he absolutely can do that. He's God. Um, we give him that sovereignty. He's sovereign God. Uh, you know, whatever he takes, he takes. He, he's... Uh, He's sovereign. But I think uh, uh, we sometimes can religiously say that and in the back of our minds harbor a little resentment that God took something away. I've met people like that. As a matter of fact, if you study the book of Job, it gets a little dicey because he starts devolving in what he's thinking about God. There's a part in, in chapter 27, he says, I cry out to you, but you don't listen to me. I stand up, and you, you merely look at me. You turn on me ruthlessly. That doesn't sound like God, does it? Something that God does. With the might of your hand, you attack me. And on and on he goes. He was, I mean, he was suffering. I'm not uh, saying anything, you know, to demean him. He was suffering, but because of the mentality that he had that the Lord gives and takes away, without thinking of it correctly, you can devolve into a, a, a bad place. He ends with, well, he doesn't end, but another thing he said is, I know you will bring me down to death. But after, you remember, he was asking for an audience with God. You remember that? And he finally got it. And, of course, an audience with God, you better gear yourself up. And after his encounter with God, 
he retracted all that he said before the encounter. He says in, jo in Job chapter 42, verse 3, and then 5 and 6, Surely I spoke of things I did not understand, things too wonderful for me to know. Then he says, My ears had heard of you, but now my eyes have seen you. Therefore, I despise myself and repent in dust and ashes. In other words, he said, I, I didn't even know what I was talking about. Even though what he said in the beginning was not sinful because he was ascribing sovereignty to God, and of course God is sovereign. But while God is more concerned with your character rather than your comfort, he goes after that first. He doesn't just take things away from us because he can. I want to take a look at tonight what God does give and what he does take away just for a moment, just to remind ourselves the awesome and wonderful and loving God that we serve. The Bible tells us in James 1.17 that every good and perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of the heavenly lights who does not change like shifting shadows. The God who gives us every good and perfect gift doesn't change and then all of a sudden turns into a God that just is out to get you. Amen? Amen? You know, we, we say those words, and, and no one would say that God is out to get me, but sometimes in the back of your mind, it feels that way, right? And so I, I wanted to address that tonight. Let's, let's talk about what God does give us. He gives us salvation, right? There's John 3.16, which we just read. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believes in him shall not perish but have everlasting Life. Now, if you and I, how many here have salvation? Raise your hand if you have salvation. Okay, you, you have the best thing in the world. It's done. We're going to go through some stuff down here, but we are good. We are saved. Do you understand that? We're going to be in eternity with Christ. Our salvation is guaranteed by Jesus Christ himself. We need to remember that when we're feeling down in the dumps, you know, uh, uh, there's a remnant that will be saved, and it's those of us that just raised our hands, we are going to be with Christ forever and ever. He gives us his love. Romans 5a says, for God demonstrates his own love towards us in this, while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. So he gives us salvation. He gives us his love. He gives us joy. Right? How many have the joy of the Lord? It's your strength. Don't let the enemy rob it from you. First Peter 5.18, I mean 1.8 says, Even though you don't see him now, you believe in him and are filled with an inexpressible and glorious joy. Uh, I have felt that joy even in the midst of sorrow. Does anybody know what I'm talking about? When you're going through some sorrow, yet underneath holding me up is the joy of the Lord, the joy of your salvation. The joy of the Lord is your strength. He gives you peace. Oh, my goodness. What is life worth without peace? And nobody, the world can't give you peace. I think you figured that out. And no one can give you peace. Peace only comes from God. Peace comes from a restored relationship with our creator. That's where peace originates from. And Jesus came to restore us with God again, the Father. Therefore, our peace is restored. That's why he said in John 14, 27, my peace I give you. I don't give it to you the way the world gives it to you. Because the world can only give it to you when things are peaceful, and unfortunately, things are never completely peaceful. God gives you purpose. He gives you purpose. We know why we're here, or you should know why you're here. And God takes care of that too. He says, I know the plans that I have for you, Jeremiah 29, 11. Plans not to harm you, but to prosper you and to give you a hope and a future. God is a giver. He gives you purpose. He gives you hope. Romans 15, 13 says, May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace so that your hope can overflow. 
You know what? If you lose hope, you're in big trouble. But we serve not only a God who gives hope, he's the God of hope. There is no other hope outside of God. He gives us hope. He gives us comfort. How many have ever been comforted by God? That's what I was uh, wanting us to come up here, to feel the embrace of God through the Holy Spirit, right? 2 Corinthians chapter 1, it says, Praise be to God and the God of all comfort who comforts us in all of our troubles. And I'm just quoting scripture. I didn't want to put them all up there to get you all confused. But it's scriptures that you all know and that we live by. He gives us comfort. God gives us strength. How many say amen? Amen. Isaiah chapter 40, verse 31. Those who wait on the Lord shall renew their strength. They will mount up with wings like eagles. They will run and not be weary. They will walk and they will not faint. He gives us strength. He gives us guidance. Uh, One of my favorite verses I quote a lot is Psalm 32, verse 8, where God says, I will teach you and I will instruct you in the way that you should go. I will counsel you and I'll watch over you. That's the God that we serve. He guides me. He guides me even though when I, I don't even know that he's doing it. He's done that all my life. Obviously, you can't live in rebellion and you can't live. You have to be walking uh, uh, with him, right, in, the, in his will. But when you do that, he guides you to where you're supposed to go and where you're supposed to wind up. I mean, I, I'm still amazed at where God has taken me from and brought me to all my life. I would have never figured it out. He gives You and me, protection. How many thank God for that? Proverbs 18.10 says, The name of the Lord is a strong tower. The righteous run into it and are safe. Amen? Amen. He gives us protection. He gives us provision. How many thank God? Philippians 4.19, And my God will supply all of your needs according to his glorious Riches in heaven. God is a giver. God gives. God gives. And then God gives some more. He loves to give. And he gave us the greatest gift of all. He didn't spare the greatest gift that he had. He gave up his own son. So that we can be secure. Amen. Amen. He's a giver, not a taker. And he doesn't randomly take what he has given you. Romans eleven twenty nine 29 says, For God's gifts and his call can never be withdrawn. But let me, let me take, uh, tell you about what God does take away. Okay? He takes away your sin. How many say amen? amen. 1 John 3, 5 says, But you know that he has appeared to take away our sins. How many here... I want you, I'm going to say this because you're going to raise your hand, but in making you raise your hand, I'm going to make you realize that your sins have been taken away. How many here, your sins have been taken away? Raise your hand. If your sins have been taken, raise your hand high if your sins have been taken away. Do you live like your sins have been taken away? Does the enemy sometimes come and lie to you and try to make, listen, he took, past tense, he took our sins away. Every single sin that you ever commit or will commit, he bore it on the cross. Don't you ever forget that. That's what he takes. He takes away your sin. He takes away your guilt. Oh, thank God, Romans 8, 33. Who will bring a charge against God's chosen? Who will bring a charge against God's chosen people? God's not bringing the charge. And let me, let me, I have great news. If God doesn't bring the charge, nobody can bring the charge. So you get the highest authority, right? When the Supreme Court makes a decision and the Supreme Court is on your side, whoever's trying to bring you down has nobody to appeal to. That's it. Supreme. Right? We serve the Supreme God. And the supreme God has declared 
that you and I are not guilty. Done. There is no appeal. Satan can't run anywhere else. God takes away our guilt. He takes away our shame. You know what he did? How he, he bore the shame on the cross. There was shame on the cross. There was shame on the cross. He, he had to stay naked on the cross. He bore our shame so that we won't have shame anymore. Don't you dare let the enemy shame you or guilt you when Jesus paid such a high price. Amen? He takes away our sickness. How many say amen? amen. Psalm 103 3 says, He forgives all your sins and heals all of your diseases. God heals our bodies, our souls, our minds. Amen? amen. How many believe that? That's right. God takes away our worries if we would just let him. 1 Peter 5, 7 tells us, cast all of your anxiety on him. Cast it all on him because he cares for you. I have a little secret to tell you. I love to do that. Because I get them, you know. I get those anxieties. Sometimes in the middle of the night, you ever wake up like this? <gasps> Right? You remember all your stuff. <laughs> like, <gasps> right? And right away, Lord, uh, here. That's what you got to do. How many of you have an anxiety or two? Raise your hand if you have an anxiety or two. <laughs> hey, cast it. Throw it, away. Throw it, throw it on you. He says, hey, hey if, some, if you were carrying a 500-pound weight that was crushing you, and someone said, hey, you know what, just give, give it here, give it here. I got this. What would you do? Yeah, take it, right? Why are we holding on to something that God took from us, and he wants to take from us, amen? amen. He takes away your fear. He takes away your fear, and you know how he does it? Because perfect love Cast out fear. That's why we were singing. And David, the psalmist, King David knew, even, even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, that's a bad valley. You've walked in that, haven't you? You ever walked through that valley? It's death seems like it's all around you. And it, it, you don't see where the where the end of it is. But David said, it's okay, even though I'm walking through that valley that this earth is full of sometimes, even though I'm walking through the valley of the shadow of death, I don't have to fear any evil. Why? Because God is with you. He's with me. If God is with you, where can you not walk and be safe? If God is with you, what territory or land or thing or property can't you walk on in full confidence with your head lifted high, not having to hide because your heavenly Father is with you? Yes. He wants to take your fear. That's what God does. He takes our fear. Now, let me get down to Timmy if you come. To the nitty gritty. God takes things that will harm you. Even if you want them. If you belong to him. And you went temporarily insane. As we are known to do sometimes. How many have been temporarily insane? It's a condition that we have. And when we go temporarily insane and we try to insist on keeping things that will harm us, God will use his sovereignty and he will take that thing from you. And I say, thank God. Thank God for his mercy. Thank God that he overrides me sometimes. 
Thank God that he overrides me when I, I'm not thinking clearly, when I've lost my way, when I've lost my sense of reason. I tell people, if, if some, listen, some people have turned away from God because of a person that's not in your life anymore. And I say, listen, God knows exactly who needs to be in your life. No person, no thing is ever worth your relationship with God. You know, we as human beings, we take things away from people that we love. When my boys were young, if I saw them with matches, you know what I would do? I would take them away. If I saw them with a sharp knife that they got a hold of somehow that we might have left around, I reach over and I would take it away because I don't want them to be harmed in any way. That's an act of love, isn't it? In the same way, God takes things away from you that you will harm yourself with because of his great love for you. I'm so thankful that he takes those things away. And I'm going to talk about one more thing that he takes away from us. He takes away things that will separate you from him. You know, there are things that not necessarily evil in in and of themselves, but that can separate or take the place of God. Blessings can easily turn into curses if they replace your attention and instead of the blesser, your mind is on the blessing. Anytime you replace God with anything, we begin to devolve. We just are not made to put anything before God. It just doesn't work for us. It's the beginning of a dangerous road. There's a big difference on waiting for God's blessings or on waiting for God. A lot of us will wait on God's blessings, but we're not so keen for waiting on God. A lot of our prayers are based on God's blessing us, where our prayers should be getting more of God in our hearts and in our lives, getting to know him better, going deeper in his word, going deeper in our intimacy with him. The blessings will come. Jesus promised that that in, in Matthew chapter 6, verse 33, seek first the kingdom of God and all of these things will be added to you. There's a, there's a reason why it's in that order. It's because the other order doesn't... See, what we'll do is we won't get to God. If the, if the other things are first, we, we, we don't quite get to God. But if we start with God, then, 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 then our, our focus is properly on Him and not on things because things don't last. There's another time that God takes something away. And that's when he wants to replace it with something better. But my point tonight is that we won't ever see victory if we believe that God is behind our suffering. God is not behind our suffering. This world is a place where there is suffering because of the corruption and decay of the world and because of uh, sin that corrupted this world. But God is not behind our suffering. He is our hope for our suffering. And God is not a thief. And he doesn't randomly take away what he gives you. Let me tell you, the one who does randomly want to take things away from you is Satan. And in John 10.10, 10, there's two parts to it. 
Jesus said this, the thief, he's the one who comes to steal, to kill, and to destroy. See, but Jesus took care of that. He says, but, and and in that word, but, he's saying, don't worry about it. Even though that's what he came to do, here's what I came to do. I came to give you life. And to give it to you in full measure. So let's have it straight in our minds. That when we say the Lord gives and he takes away. It's all for your benefit and for mine. Let's not indict God. And thinking he took something good away from us. God would never do that. You as a parent. If you're here and you have children. Would you ever take away anything good from your children? Of course not. And that's us. Imagine God. Amen. Let's bow our heads right now. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Father, we thank you, Lord, for uh, light from your word, Lord Jesus. Thank you, Heavenly Father, that you are a giver. Lord, and and the first thing that you give us, God, that we should be done is you give us yourself. Lord, a relationship with you. Lord, all the good things that come from that, oh God. Restoration, oh God. Lord, being, being called righteous, oh God. Lord, not having to bear the weight of our mistakes, our sins. Lord God, all the things that we did wrong, oh Lord God. Lord, uh, not being, uh, Lord God, a plagued, Lord God, with guilt because you took that too and, and shame, oh Lord God. Oh Lord Jesus, that we would have the correct view of you, Lord God. So that Father, when we are in that valley, Lord God, that sometimes we find ourselves in, in this life, oh God. Lord, that instead of despair and, Lord, uh, uh, just thinking that you put us there or that, uh, God, you did something to get us, Father, that instead we will walk boldly through that valley because, God, you gave us yourself and you're walking through us in that very valley. And in that very valley, oh, God, just to show us the supreme God that you are and your supreme love for us, O oh God. Lord, in that valley, you declare that goodness and mercy will follow us right in that valley of the shadow of death. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Lord, how you make that happen, I have no idea. You do the impossible thing, O oh God. Lord, most people would think of sure goodness and mercy following in, in bright paths, O oh God. But, Lord, you make goodness and mercy follow us, God, in the darkest times so that we would know that it is well with our soul no matter where we find ourselves, God, until we come safely home into your ever-loving arms to be with you forever, oh, God. Lord, show your people, comfort your people, give grant revelation, oh, Lord God, that we would have the right thinking, oh, God, so that when the enemy comes to knock on our door with his lies, oh God, we can rebuke him and send him back from where he came, oh Lord God, by resisting, Lord God, those thoughts that are from hell itself, Lord Jesus. We declare the love of God over us. We declare, oh God, salvation over us. We declare, oh God, that we are righteous in your sight because of the blood of Jesus. And we do declare that goodness and mercy will follow us all the days of our lives. And together, oh God, Lord, we're going to be together dwelling in your house forever and ever and ever and ever. We're practicing here, oh Lord God, for that time. We love you, Lord, and we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. I want us to take the next few moments, just form prayer circles, and just pray for each other. Pray for the the revelation of God's Word. God's Word is awesome, but a lot of times we we get stuck, and we need God's Holy Spirit to, to bring it 
alive in our hearts, amen, amen. so that we can face what this world throws at us because it throws things at us left and right, but we have everything that we need to handle that, amen? Let's all stand. Let's find some prayer partners, get some prayer circles going. Let's pray for each other, lift each other up in the name of Jesus. And I will close this with a prayer.